Okay. All right, welcome back, uh, everyone. And uh, this is the very last uh, lecture for today and for the summer school. Uh, it's my great pleasure to invite Dr. Claire Monteleone for uh, this uh, last session for the school. Uh, Claire is an associate professor of computer science at the University of Colorado Boulder, where she joined in 2018 following positions at the University of Paris Saclay. CNRS, George Washington University, and Columbia University. Uh, she completed her PhD and master's in computer science at MIT and was a postdoc at UC San Diego. She also holds a bachelor's in earth and planetary sciences from Harvard. Her research is on machine learning for the study of climate change that helped launch the interdisciplinary field of climate informatics. In 2011, she co-founded the International Conference on Climate Informatics, which turns 10 years old this year and has attracted climate scientists and data scientists from over 20 countries in 30 US states. She gave an invited tutorial on climate change challenges for machine learning at Europe in 2014. Thank you very much, Claire, for joining us today and we're looking forward to your talk. Thanks for the introduction. So I'm assuming everyone can hear me and see my slides unless someone pipes up. Um, yes, yeah, you're running a great event, thank you. So I'm gonna focus on deep unsupervised learning approaches for climate informatics. And we um, study climate informatics due to the threat of climate change and the extreme events we've been seeing such as mega storms and heat waves uh, resulting in wildfire and drought and their effects on communities and ecosystems. And climate informatics is based on the vision that machine learning can shed light on climate change um, and as Kartik mentioned, we already have critical mass. So bringing together data science, statistics, AI, data mining, machine learning with all uh, walks of climate science and also some meteorology and, and broader areas. Um, as mentioned, we started the workshop 10 years ago. Uh, this year, it's a conference. Uh, it's supposed to be at Oxford, but will be virtual. And if I could make a quick plug, on Tuesday, you could submit either just a short AGU style, uh, although free, abstract um, or a full eight page uh, paper submission for our uh, proceedings. Uh, the deadline was extended to Tuesday and uh, join us there online. Um, so when we talked to NARIPS about six years ago and tried to map out where machine learning could um, have an impact, and this is great for those attending the summer school um, learning these machine learning methods and wanting to figure out how to impact them in their area, or also if there's any machine learners um, on the summer school uh, areas in climate where you might want to get involved. But keep in mind, this is sort of like the early days of bioinformatics. So we were just trying to um, really break up the world uh, of, of problems into areas that machine learning uh, could have impact. Um, so paleoclimate reconstruction, of course, we have major data sparsity of our, our climate proxies over space and time. Um, in green are some of the topics that I've worked on in my lab. Um, today, I'm only gonna talk about two of them. Um, so I'm gonna talk about downscaling in a moment. We've also done a big push in my lab on um, trying to use AI coupled with um, observation data to sort of robustify um, climate model ensemble predictions. But I'm not talking about that today. Um, lots, of course, of spatiotemporal issues, um, of course, with very interesting um, dependencies in both space and time. And then, um, you know, hearkening back to those pictures of extremes, we've worked on extremes. We'll see just a little bit on that today. But again, um, if you don't see your favorite research area here, um, don't worry, machine learning can definitely have an impact. Um, so today, I um, for the summer school want to focus on methods in unsupervised deep learning. Um, and I'm really glad to be following the great uh, detailed tutorial by Mustafa on this. Um, I'm also going to be talking about semi supervised learning and self supervised learning. Um, and I'm going to describe these methods via two case studies. So one is on an avalanche detection task and one is on a downscaling task um, for temperature and precipitation. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll take a pause. If somebody can remind me, I'll try to take a pause between the two case studies. 
for questions and then also hit questions at the end. Um, so first sort of a pointer and this um, for those that either didn't see this morning's talk or just want a quick refresher um, that sort of really understand at a high level what we mean when we talk about training a deep learning model. This is sort of a pointer to you, but if you don't, um, if this doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry, we'll get into specifics when we talk about specific case studies. But at a really high level, in supervised deep learning, the network parameters W are fit by optimizing, by doing a gradient descent on some prediction loss function. And a prediction loss function will compare the output of a neural network given some input data X, we'll call the output Y hat, with what we call the true or ground truth label Y for that X. So if you're trying to predict a scalar value, you might look at um, mean squared error here. So you'll write down some loss function that compares the desired prediction to the prediction of the network. And then you'll do gradient descent. Um, so in a nutshell, all of deep learning is that you're gonna use the chain rule to take these small gradient uh, steps on the prediction loss and update uh, all your weight parameters, W and your whole network. So for those of you that that means something from earlier in this week, I really want to use um, this slide to just show how simple it is to go from supervised deep learning to unsupervised deep learning. The only change, so we still have this um, set of weights that we're gonna train. The only change is that our loss function cannot be a function of some label Y. So for classification or regression, we don't have a label. So um, given a network's input X, we can penalize the network's output simply by comparing it to the network's input. But there's a lot of different loss functions you can write down here. Um, I'm not even going to get into the whole field of clustering, but clustering is a setting where loss is defined solely on the input data. And so you can do uh, deep approaches to clustering here as well. So the only thing that has changed is that there's no label Y, but we've got a loss function. We're going to do gradient descent. And then using the chain rule, we'll figure out the incremental updates to make to all our network weights W. Okay. So this should hopefully, you know, open you up to designing loss functions when you don't have labels. So when you don't have ground truth uh, data, but you, you'd still like to use some deep learning for your application. Um, so the, the focus is going to be on these two case studies. One is um, a semi-supervised um, deep learning pipeline that has a unsupervised component for an avalanche detection task. And then the other is an unsupervised um, deep learning approach um, that can also be uh, uh, viewed as self-supervised for temperature and precipitation downscaling. So, okay, the avalanche detection task. Um, and I'll first sort of mention as a side thing that people can contact me about later. We've done other work not using deep learning, using uh, probabilistic modeling to automatically define and learn multivariate extreme events. Uh, we've done hurricane track prediction that was using um, a, a fused CNN type model to fuse different data fields. But um, another thing we've done recently on extremes is avalanche detection. Um, and actually what I'm talking about is unpublished we published at CI last year our supervised version, the CNN version that we'll compare against as a benchmark. This version has only been a post or a talk at a workshop at NRIPS. Um, so yeah, the VAE version is, um, is a manuscript for now. Um, and it's led by Sophie, my former postdoc in the yellow square and Somia, my current PhD student. Um, so this is apparently important for climate change. Um, you know, avalanches are dangerous and then understanding them could also help us understand about climate change impacts. Um, but the for the purpose of this summer school where we care about, you know, what are the challenges here for machine learning? If you think about detecting avalanche 
in satellite imagery, we're gonna be looking at SAR um, sensing products. Um, the avalanches within just the other snow, avalanche deposits are rare. And so this is what we call a severe class imbalance problem. So if you view avalanche as a positive example, um, that's very rare in your data. So that's a class imbalance. Um, and then by ground truth, we literally mean data collected on the ground by humans trekking into certain avalanche corridors in the French Alps. This is with Meteo France. Um, and so we have some set amount of ground truth labeled data. We're not going to be able to get more. Um, and to distinguish, we're not talking about data that is labeled by humans looking at the SAR imagery and trying to segment them into where avalanche deposits have fallen. In fact, our Meteo France collaborators would like to start a study on that, but um, they have found that even for trained experts, that's a pretty hard task. So what we're doing is we actually have um, just the unlabeled SAR imagery and this limited ground truth measurement um, taken by Meteo France by people hiking out into this Haute-Maurienne region of the French Alps. Okay, so we don't have any intermediate human labeled imagery. So again, why is this a challenge for machine learning? We have severe class imbalance and we have a fixed small amount of labeled data and as much unlabeled data as we want. Okay, so again, in a punchline style, I'm going to explain our approach, but there might be jargon if you miss Mustafa's talk this morning that you don't know about yet. And so we'll come back to that. But for those that this means something, Here's your, your punchline of our idea. So, okay, we could view this as an anomaly detection task because um, we have severe class imbalance and avalanche deposits are relatively rare in the massive amounts of, of image, imagery of snow that we have. Um, and so let's think through the following approach to anomaly detection, which is that we could train a a VAE, a variational autoencoder, which I'll review um, shortly, but basically an unsupervised model on images that we know do not have an avalanche in them. Okay, so then we'd have a model of negative examples. Um, we said we're going to treat this as anomaly detection, so there's some supervised aspect, right? We have to say when we think something is an anomaly. So in step three, we are, um, since we're going to use this as a classifier, we need to set the threshold on the VAE's reconstruction error to classify a new image. So I've trained my data on non avalanche images. I send in an unlabeled image. Um, I'm going to get some reconstruction error. So how well, um, how well the, the model parameters as learned on the training data can reconstruct the image and if it's high, then this image is not similar to the data that was trained on and that's when we should classify it as an anomaly. So to set the threshold, um, we do require supervision. So for that, we'll use images that were labeled um, by aligning them with the ground truth uh, survey that we have. Okay, but if you look at this picture, we not only do we need supervision in three, there's kind of a, a bottleneck of supervision before we can run two, right? Because we're saying that we would train a VAE only on the negative examples. So that means that we needed to waste supervision even just to sort out um, positive versus negative images. So the twist that we take here is that we say, look, let's um, change two to just train the VAE on all our satellite imagery without having um, gone through any supervisory bottleneck to see um, if there are avalanches or no avalanches in it. Um, we still need to go through three, which is a, a hyperparameter tuning um, phase to tune the threshold. And that, of course, is done with our limited supervised data. Of course, the threshold, the actual threshold used for the anomaly detector um, 
will probably be different depending on whether we trained on only negative examples or all the examples. Um, but what we show is that um, we can remove supervision entirely from step two. And so use our supervision only in that, in that, that step for setting the anomaly detection threshold. Okay. Um, and so as a reminder, um, so just going back to before, we have um, a loss function, say reconstruction error that can depend on the input and the output. There's no external um, label. There's only a label when we're turn tuning the threshold. Um, so quick review. So if you did see Ms. Mustafa's talk, this should hopefully review your knowledge. If you didn't, um, I just needed to define these terms. So we're, we're in the unsupervised setting and we can think about training an auto encoder. Um, and so if you think about this machine, what is it doing? It doesn't seem very helpful. It gives you an image and it tries to output the same image. So once you've trained that, that's not gonna be particularly helpful as, as stated. But the point here is that that training is sort of a pretext task for finding some representation for your data set in this uh, bottleneck layer. Um, so that'll be a compact representation of the input distribution um, that we call the latent representation. And this is a dense autoencoder, meaning that we go from uh, the input dimension to a lower dimensional space. So you can view that as a dimensionality reduction technique. Um, note that there are also wide autoencoders where you go to a higher dimension in the middle. And that comes up in a lot of cognitive science applications. It's been shown, for example, that fruit flies encode um, smells. So in their olfactory system, by projecting to a higher dimensional space. Similarly, um, sparse coding and overcomplete representations are thought to be at play in the human visual system. So if you want to go to a higher dimensional space, that's often because you want to make sure you have sparse and well-separated representations. Um, I think for, um, for climate, I think it's safe for now to mostly talk about dense autoencoders where we're looking for a compact representation of our training data. Um, and as Mustafa mentioned, going from a vanilla autoencoder to a variational autoencoder means that now I'm actually going to learn a distribution over my latent space as a result of training on my training data. Um, and so standard BAE would learn some Gaussian distribution. You'll initialize it with uh, some maybe standard isotropic Gaussian, but then you'll learn your parameters uh, mu and your covariance matrix. Um, okay, so back to the, the setting that we're talking about. So the kind of first version that I mentioned was that the VAE would be trained on just the negative examples. And so what that means is that there's this supervisory step that happens first where we kind of pair image patches with the um, associate, uh, associated ground truth data, the labeled surveys. And then we'll feed only negative examples to train an autoencoder, so uh, a variational autoencoder. That's what's represented um, between the two gray boxes. Um, and, um, and of course, an autoencoder is trying to reconstruct the input. The other version of two, where the VAE is trained um, on all examples, means that we skip that supervision at the beginning. We just um, you know, take patches from all our, our uh, satellite uh, images and train an autoencoder. Okay, so those are two steps. We would do one of them or the other of them. Um, we're sort of focusing on this one, but then we'll compare to the previous one in the experiments. Um, after that step, of course, we do need to tune the threshold because we're going to be doing anomaly detection, which is a supervised task. So um, how does that work? Now we take our labeled data from, um, from pairing the ground survey with the satellite images. So we know whether a, um, a patch is positive or negative. Of course, we don't feed the label to the VAE. The VAE just takes the image 
it tries to uh, reconstruct it. We compute our reconstruction error, which is again, a function of the network's input and output. And then we set our threshold such that um, it gets most of the images labeled one as avalanches and most of the label images labeled zero as non avalanches. This is simple hyperparameter tuning on a labeled validation data set. Once that's tuned, how do we uh, use it? So the pipeline is, we have a new test image. We don't know the label. We send it through the autoencoder. We reconstruct, um, we, we, you know, the autoencoder outputs some image. Sorry, this is on the already trained autoencoder. Now we can compute the reconstruction error. Threshold has been fixed, right, on our validation set. So we just compare to threshold to predict, uh, to detect avalanche or no avalanche. Okay. So um, our, our collaborators work in this domain and um, apparently even very recently, it was sort of state of the art to just, without machine learning, kind of just threshold certain quantities in the image, but you'll see you can get these spurious, really teeny little avalanche dots occurring in the middle of a ski town and um, that, uh, that's why they wanted to turn to machine learning because of issues with just thresholding. Um, and so we can evaluate with thresholding, which we're calling here the baseline and supervised um, learning. We did a CNN approach in last year's CI. Um, you'll see even these baselines really have quite a lot of trouble. It's a pretty hard uh, problem. These are not very great F1 or balanced accuracy scores. But we do see that we get a lift when we use our, um, our semi-supervised pipelines. And so this uh, second to bottom row is saying that the VAE is trained only on the negative examples and then the threshold is tuned. And then this last line, actually the whole pipeline, even of this last line is semi-supervised the VAE is trained in an unsupervised fashion, so on all the imagery, and then its threshold, of course, is, is tuned um, on a labeled validation set. And so you'll see that we get a significant lift by uh, training the VAE in an unsupervised fashion. Um, and so there's sort of a couple things at play. Some of them might be unintuitive. Um, so certainly the when you train the VAE on all the data instead of only the negative data, you're training on more data, right? So that's generally something that we would expect would improve performance in machine learning. However, what's the difference in the two data sets between the negative examples and all the data? Well, it's the positive examples. So instead, in some sense, we've trained on like dirtier data because there's, um, there's avalanche uh, signal in that data. Um, but keep in mind that all the methods had their um, hyperparameters tuned um, independently on the same labeled validation set. So ultimately, the threshold used to decide whether something is an anomaly or not is different. Um, but in some sense, the completely unsupervised version that had this sort of noisier data, you can view that as basically having um, been exposed basically as a form of regularization, which will allow it to generalize more. Okay. Um, and we also saw a lift on like ROC type measures of, of doing this in a completely unsupervised manner, other than tuning the threshold. Um, okay, so this is um, might be useful in your other applications where you have rare events and there's a, a limitation on the amount of labeled data that you have. Um, this also sort of falls into um, the framework that it's sort of emerging in AI for Earth Sciences as of learning a virtual sensor, right? So instead of having to send humans to all the avalanche corridors, we're trying to learn a function from the SAR data to um, to basically um, detect when there's avalanches without sending in a human. Um, some other examples that I know of, I think NOAA is interested in um, 
virtual radar. So learning a virtual version of radar from other signals and uh, Google, um, the geo group in Google is, uh, has this air view project where they're trying to learn um, uh, basically se several atmospheric chemistry um, metrics that they were able to take on some of their street view cars were really expensive to instrument. So they wanna see if they can um, use other signals to infer proxy versions of those. Um, and of course, the next step with Avalanche is forecasting. So I guess this is a good stopping point for questions. Okay, should I just pick and choose some of these? I see your screen. Uh, sure, yeah. Okay, so from Weiming, if I get it correct, used all data to train the VAE as if you're training the avalanche as outliers and hope VAE does not learn those rare examples. Um, basically, so there's two things going on. One is, Yes, we are learning the VAE on all data. But um, I guess you could think of it as outliers. Basically, the avalanche images are so scarce in the data um, that they're not going to change our parameters by too much. But then also for the anomaly detector, we're still going to tune with labeled data the threshold on when we predict an anomaly. And so ultimately right if you view the avalanches as adding kind of some noise i guess you're saying outliers in the training data um we still get to tune a threshold that that works well on the validation data to, to be a good anomaly detector detector and not only that there's a lot of evidence in the field of machine learning that when you choose when you when you train on slightly noisy data you'll then be more robust to noise in uh, future observations, which helps you generalize better. So we call that a form of regularization. Okay, from Morteza, what is the example, what is the advantage of VAE for avalanche detection over a logistic regression with probability output or decision tree or simply vanilla deep learning? So we, um, before doing convolutional neural networks, we compared with some of the standard vanilla machine learning techniques that's in our CI 2019 paper. And that was a paper that proposed, uh, you know, feed forward convolutional neural network. And the advantage against the convolutional network of our approach was shown in the table on our slide. So we get a significant lift especially with the fully unsupervised version. Um, and so, you know, partly it's that when you train the CNN, we have high class imbalance. Um, so you can either train with a balance and then use a threshold itself that indicates the imbalance for predictions, or you can uh, generate fake data to train your CNN. Um, we generally found that this unsupervised approach performed better because we're in the high class imbalance setting. And not only that, we have severely limited uh, labeled data. So any of your standard core ML techniques that are supervised are gonna be limited in that fashion. Great question. Um, can terrain slope be used as one, the threshold to detect anomaly? Um, so, we, we did have a multivariate um, set of inputs. Um, you know, there's metadata recorded such as angles, um, et cetera. So um, I believe some of those were features. Um, and so that's not gonna like directly give us a threshold. That's gonna be an input feature. Great question. Um, a Chang said, um, could you explain why the loss function does not have 
the label Y? What is the impact of omitting Y in the loss function? So this is switching from supervised machine learning, which you may have some, seen some of earlier in the week, where, you know, say the goal is to forecast a scalar like temperature, then the correct temperature would be needed in your training data along with the, the field of inputs that you're trying to forecast temperature from. But unsupervised learning sort of opens things up and says, well, I might not already have uh, data conveniently labeled with ground truth, so what can I do instead? And the tasks that you can do now are actually kind of different. You can do clustering, you can do dimensionality reduction, you can do data imputation, matrix completion. You can't do, you know, exact, um, exactly supervised learning unless, so our whole pipeline here with the VAE was actually semi-supervised, right? Because we did use some data that had Y in it, i.e. the binary label avalanche or no avalanche for tuning that threshold, okay? Um, so if you have a supervised learning task, you will need that Y. Um, Okay, so Vitaly, are you tuning your threshold to? So I, I'll take Vitaly's question and then I'll go back to the rest of the talk. Um, I'm glad there's interest, but I, I also am halfway through and I wanna get to the next part. So are you tuning your threshold to encompass all positive examples during the training or only some percent of the examples? Um, just think of this as um, a held out labeled data set with the same, um, true positive rate um, as in the labeled training data set. So um, it's, it's certainly not the same data that was used to train the, the VAE. It's a held out set, just a held out validation set. Cool, so can we go back uh, to the talk? There we go. Great, so, and then it, in the, I'll be at the panel and also at the Q&A if people have more questions about uh, the VAE stuff. Okay, so now we're gonna take things one thing further beyond VAE. I think everything that you have understood so far um, from previous talks about VAE will be helpful um, and talk about an unsupervised deep learning approach that we applied to downscaling um, that can also be viewed as self-supervised. So um, this is the work of Brian Gronke. Um, he just finished up his master's with me and he's going off to Potsdam to do a PhD in a um, climate lab. And he also summered at Jupiter Intelligence where he worked with Steve Sane. Um, over the summer they, and Luke Madeus, over the summer, they did a supervised approach to downscaling, trying to port some of the newest super resolution techniques. Um, but then on this unsupervised approach, um, he, he also got some advice from Luke Medeas at Jupiter. So he wanted to address downscaling. Um, and just to be very clear, because in machine learning, we might call that upscaling or something, but um, you know, of course, for the people on the call that are from climate, you know that the goal is to use some spatiotemporal data at a coarser scale to try to infer values at finer scales. And his conclusion after this summer using supervised learning approaches to super resolution out of the field of computer vision is that this is not really the best match for the downscaling problem because we always have um, processes at finer and finer scales in, in climate meteorology. And we don't just kind of want to do in painting and, um, and lose out on the additional information that might be at those finer scales. Of course, there's a field of statistical downscaling. Um, our sort of ML take on that existing work is that it's typically done in a supervised way, meaning that for every image at coarse scale, I would need an image at finer scale in order to train my method. Also, we found that for the most part, they did point predictions, which again means that the method once trained would take an image at coarse scale and output an image at fine scale, just one image. We'd actually like to have a distribution that we can sample from. So we were interested in doing generative downscaling. 
Um, and so Brian cast this generative downscaling task in the framework of domain alignment from machine learning and applied some very recent works um, using a domain alignment approach, approach that uses normalizing flows. And this is just unsupervised, this is deep generative unsupervised learning for the task of domain alignment. But I want to say that in terms of how it worked so well, that we can interpret this as a form of self-supervision. So the self-supervisory signal is that even though we have coarse scale and fine scale, and even though the images were generated by two different processes, one's reanalysis data and one is actually the output of NWP, they were both aligned over the continental US. So there's some underlying structure that relates them. And so that uh, we would view as a form of self-supervision in our field. Um, so we had reanalysis data, ERA data at one degree latitude and longitude resolution. Um, we did a temperature task and a precipitation task. And then for the fine grained, we used um, WARF NWP um, outputs at one eighth degree resolution, latitude, longitude. Okay, um, so the domain alignment task in machine learning is saying that if I have two random variables, X and Y, and I have access to IID samples from each of their marginals, I want to learn a mapping F, actually a bijection, so that um, given X, X, little xi samples um, distributed from the marginal of x, and then applying that function f, I will be able to approximate, approximate the marginal of y. And similarly, given little yi, which are um, distributed according to the marginal of y, if I apply um, f inverse, I should be able to approximate the marginal of x. So how can this be phrased um, to help with downscaling, well, um, now X and Y don't have any important meanings like example label as on the avalanche setting. These are just two different domains where we have access to samples from each of their marginals. So one could be the coarse grain resolution, so distributions over uh, coarse grain resolution um, measurements and one over the fine grain. Um, and again, they could be generated by different processes as we had in our example. Um, I think from the way that we're gonna draw the figure later for the architecture, X is from the coarse grain resolution and Y, so X is um, our distribution over the coarse grain resolution and Y is over the fine grain resolution. Um, so the idea in this um, recent paper, Align Flow, is that you know, ultimately we're, we want to learn a, an informative distribution over a shared latent space, Z, that sort of connects X and Y, because that is actually a way to infer um, the joint distribution over X and Y. Um, we have to use variational methods because otherwise it would be intractable to approximate the joint, but we um, assume conditional independence of each of the domains, X and Y, so they're conditionally independent, conditioned on the latent domain Z. Um, and then you can see how this allows us to compute the joint. So given samples from the marginal of X, samples from the marginal of Y, then of course we're gonna, uh, to solve something like this, we're gonna have to be able to estimate the conditional probability of X um, given the latent variable Z and similarly for Y and we're gonna use the align flow method to do that. That involves normalizing flows, which I will dis, uh, describe on the next slide, where essentially we can get much more informative distributions over our latent space, so I'll describe that. The, the take home for why this is unsupervised and why this also might make your, down, your life as a downscaler easier is that the training does not require paired examples. So I just need a lot of examples at my coarse grain scale, a lot of examples at my fine grain scale, but I never need um, pairings saying um, this map um, at coarse grain um, is equivalent to this map at fine grain. So it's unsupervised. So 
normalizing flows. I think Mustafa touched on this briefly after kind of motivating a lot of the problems and concerns with GANs, sort of the biggest uh, problem. I mean, my group loves GANs. We're, we're trying to study GANs, but in terms of like applying them in practice, you don't end up with um, a distribution over a latent space or even a direct way to encode into the latent space. Um, and this is in addition to other like training issues that uh, Mustafa mentioned and also issues such as mode collapse. Um, so a normalizing flow um, allows us, so if you think about the variational autoencoder, we, even though we learn all the parameters of a Gaussian, it's still just a Gaussian. What if we want more informative uh, distribution? So the idea is starting from a very simple prior on our latent space, which could be say uniform or an isotropic Gaussian, we're going to learn parameters of a series of invertible transformations um, and um, so, so here you can see these, these compositions. So for each of these FIs, we're going to learn um, those parameters. And that allows us to have learned a much more informative um, distribution over the latent space. You can see as we go from left to right, either from uniform or unit Gaussian using certain kinds of flows, you can get more interesting um, informative distributions over the latent space. That was from the first normalizing flow paper. We actually used um, a different example of a normalizing flow, but the idea is the same. The idea is I don't just want to have a Gaussian over my shared latent space. I want to be able to learn something potentially much more informative, but again, it has to be invertible. Um, so Brian proposed this climb align architecture. Um, the architecture is essentially a line flow, um, which recently came out in AAAI, in this AAAI. Um, however, instead of, um, however, for the normalizing flow, we used Glow, which um, generates extremely realistic images and is really good for image data. It's basically using um, invertible one by one convolutions at a, at a high level, but feel free to check the paper. And this looks like really a lot of detail going on. I think you can ignore a lot of this because the only parameters, you know, other than some reshaping that we have to do the only parameters that we have to learn are for the normalizing flows. And so, you know, from the previous slide, we can learn a set of parameters phi um, that parameterize this mapping, of course, composed of individual um, invertible mappings that'll um, get us a bijection between one domain and the latent space. And similarly, a mapping um, which we learn the parameters of from the other domain and the latent space. So here we have Y as our high resolution domain, X as our low resolution domain. You could set this up however you want. However, we're not going to do any dimensionality reduction here. Z is just meant to sort of domain align between X and Y. Um, so to make life easier, we're going to have it be the same dimension as Y, which means X has to be upsampled to also be the same dimension as Y. But we do so in a way that will add the minimum um, information. So we just kind of look at neighboring pixels to, um, to smooth in some values there that shouldn't add information. Um, and so we were not aware of any unsupervised techniques for this. So we had to compare with supervised benchmarks. Not only that, we weren't aware of generative techniques. So the only way we could compare was on point predictions. So that means that these tables are evaluated with paired data, where you have data at the high dimensional, uh, at the coarse resolution and the fine resolution. And so then we would just um, look at performance on, you know, um, on these point predictions, on, on reconstructing what is thought to be the, um, the finer resolution one. So BCSD, I think, is kind of uh, the standard technique in, um, in downscaling. This BMD is a CNN approach that was published by Banyo Medina in Climate Informatics 2019. Um, so these are two supervised approaches. And then ours is unsupervised and also generative. Um, and we see it is usually not that much better, sorry, not that much worse than BCSD, sometimes better than BCSD, and usually a little worse than the CNN version, okay? But the benefit is you can apply it in settings where you don't have paired images, where the CNN version is, both of these versions are supervised, 
And then also you get this whole generative uh, model instead of just point predictions. So let's look at some of the generations. We could take the ERA image at the upper left corner as input. And for reference, this is not input to the algorithm, but for reference, the middle top image um, that was paired with this in our labeled data set, our supervised data set, is the warp image in the middle top row. And our maximum likelihood prediction from our trained climb align model is the one with the gray shading. So that's like a relatively plausible uh, fine grained um, precipitation map that is pretty comparable with the middle image. But we can also um, just conditioned on this ERA image as input, we could sample um, as much as we want and get these conditional samples in the bottom row. Right, so we don't just have to have one prediction. Okay, so that's a qualitative example of how these things could be used. Um, also, following this technique in the machine learning literature that I think actually there was one Mustafa slide that showed how you could walk along the latent manifold doing a, 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 an interpolation in latent space and then um, generate from your latent space samples. I think maybe he was in a VAE setting, so you would feed that latent representation through your decoder. Um, but let me explain what we're doing here. So um, at the top left and top right, we have two images from um, WARF, two actual WARF generated images. And by the way, you'll see from the architecture, everything was um, symmetric. So you could downscale, you could also upscale. And in this particular example, we're gonna go from fine grained to coarse grained. So we have the WARF training, uh, the WARF data examples at the far left and the far right. We walk in um, latent space, and then at each point in latent space that we walk to interpolate, so, okay, we get the latent space representation of each of the images, and then we interpolate between them in latent space, and then we uh, generate um, images um, at the course resolution, the three images in the middle on the top, and then all the images on the bottom were generated by our model from the, um, from the associated latent space representation. So, I mean, I'll leave it to you domain experts, but apparently these are relatively plausible, say, temporal interpolations um, at the two scales. So at WARF type data and ERA interim type data. Um, cool, yeah, I wanted to wrap up with enough time for questions. So actually that is it, thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting ideas and, and methods pushing sort of the forefront of deep learning and, and GANs into climate. Uh, very exciting work. Uh, I think we have quite a few questions, so I'll let you pick the ones that you'd like to go with. Um, cool. Uh, Let's see. Let me read some of these. Yeah, so it looks like Jakir is um, talking about the first part of the talk. And um, I alluded to this a little bit in answering the, one of the previous questions. So there's a couple reasons. Um, okay, so the question is, why does VAE perform better than CNN? Um, CNN is a supervised method, which means that it can only be trained with labeled data. And remember in the avalanche problem, we only had a fixed limited amount of labeled data. So CNN is gonna have some, um, some barrier on how well it can do because you know, within that labeled data, we have to do um, you know, our training, our hyperparameter tuning, et cetera. Um, and what was my other point about that that I actually already said? Uh, oh, so the, the two machine learning ch challenges, right? One was very limited data. The other was class imbalance, right? And so you can artificially balance your data set 
and train a CNN. And then when you're predicting, have an additional threshold to, for um, the frequency that you expect um, things to be your rare event. But if you're doing an artificially balanced data set, then um, the size of your data set gets even smaller because you have so few positive examples. Um, so these are, these are most of the issues that we ran against with CNN. But you know, CNN did perform the baseline uh, method from the literature and the other um, kind of straw man canonical uh, methods that we applied. And that was in our last year's paper. OK. How fair is it to assume that should be a shared latent space Z? OK. Let me, so for Derek, I'll answer a few parts. You have kind of two questions. How did we know important hidden features of high resolution aren't lost at low resolution? So the latent space resolution is high. Remember, so I did, we did a little upsampling from our low resolution data so that at least in terms of like the guts of the model, we're always at the same dimension. So the latent space has the same um, resolution as the high resolution space. But your question about how can we assume there's going to be some informative latent space, shared latent space, has to do with my comment at the beginning. I mentioned self-supervision. This is maybe a jargon that hasn't been introduced this week in the summer school, which is saying, even though we don't have paired images, is there some reason to believe that there's some shared structure that the model is going to benefit from. And like in computer vision, we might see this in video where we don't have labels, say we're trying to do object detection, but certain pixels, if we consider the time dimension, certain groups of pixels have similar behavior over time and we can do object recognition that way. Um, so usually the forms of self-supervision are temporal or spatial. Here, it's that even though we have different resolutions, you know, the WARF data and the ER8 data that we're using was always centered over the same larger Latlon region. So I view that as a form of self-supervision and due to like geographical alignment and say physics, I think that lends uh, to our belief that there should be a shared latent space. That said, I've been giving this talk a lot for some reason, all my talks were this month and um, people, you know, domain experts are saying, well, what's the physical interpretation of the latent space? And we can't, we can't really give you that as of yet. That, that's an interpretability issue. Uh, uh, could I ask a, a short yeah. follow up uh, just related to that and also thinking about what Pierre presented uh, is there a way of specifying some sort of length scale associated with, you know, each resolution? Um, would that be, would that be helpful in, in trying to figure out that there is some underlying structure? So physical length or time length? Uh, a spatial length scale. Yeah. So if you're trying to do, say, going from low resolution spatial data to high resolution spatial data, uh, besides knowing that you're working on the same lat long uh, sort of boundaries, giving the actual spatial resolution as well as another parameter. Oh, so you're saying that could be a feature. Maybe, yeah, I haven't thought about it. We, we can jam about that offline. But this reminds me of the question that you asked for the last talk and I piped up in the chat. So Ben C's question, which uh -huh. is, um, actually kind of parallel to the question you asked about time frame with climate change. So he was saying the high resolution warp data will include the warp model biases, ERA has its own biases. How will these interact in the process? So let's just say that these are biases. These are different kinds of data with biases. And then we can roll in the question that Kartik um, mentioned had been coming up a lot in the summer school, which is, could you have your high resolution data? Well, my version of the question that, that I can answer. Do, um, could your high resolution data be from maybe the same like continental US, but a different time period than your low resolution data? 
I'll roll that into the question of the biases in the data generating process with Ben's question. And we, um, we basically have encouraging results about that. So in Brian's thesis, where there's many, many, many more results, um, he did an example where they're from different time frames. And then to Ben's question, we as machine learners just didn't care, didn't care to worry about those different biases and the fact that um, there are different processes. I think where this is going to be reflected in the model is in the actual parameters learned, which are just the parameters of those normalizing flows. Okay, so, um, you know, we're training on distributions you know, that are different, and then we're learning a domain alignment via the shared latent space. So I think this is nice because then you don't have to, you know, you could use observation data for one, uh, model, model data for another. Oops, there goes my headphones. Cool. Uh, is downscaling code available as open source and for collaboration? Yes. I don't have the link. So Brian Gronke is the student, but I will try to share the link later with um, Kartik and DJ. Um, I'm pretty sure that he has that. Would like to downscale a global climate model using a regional climate model. Yeah, that could be cool. Wei Ming, I'm not a climatologist, but I'm curious what are some common challenges in upscaling go from a fine resolution to a coarse resolution. Yeah, I mean, that's not usually really the direction that people care about. It's just that now this model is, is a full probabilistic model, so you can go in either direction. So not only that, not only can you do something uh, conditional, like you input an image at one dimension and sample as many images that you want at the other resolution, you could do unconditional sampling which is you literally just sample uh, from the posterior, this complex informative distribution that we've learned over the latent space and just get latent samples from which you can generate um, samples at either domain. So you can do conditional or unconditional sampling with this kind of model. Um, have you tried, this is Suzo, have you tried a supervised version of the climb align to see if it beats the CNN? Um, I'm not sure what you mean. So climb align is trained unsupervised. Maybe you're saying if you train climb align with data that you know is paired, would it beat the CNN? Um, <clears throat> I don't think climb align would know that the data was paired. It, it would just be similar to claiming, uh, training it with examples from the two different marginals. That said, it's a very interesting question and one that I'll, I'll bring back to the student. Um, okay, ALP. Yeah, so I totally skipped the, the resize aspects. So a lot of what you're doing is like, you know, taking an image into um, a different shaped block. Um, and that is explained in Brian's thesis. I believe it is also explained in the original Align Flow paper, which is by Aditya Grover and others in AAAI 2020. So yeah, I completely skipped over um, those, uh, those shaping issues of just like how you indicate your different arrays. Um, so I don't know, Kartik, should I wrap up with the questions or? Uh, I think we still have a minute or two, uh, if there are any other interesting ones. Okay. Could our explicit knowledge of atmospheric mechanisms and physical laws be used to improve a machine learning weather forecast? Could the tools be scaled effectively to HPC? And this is from you, Paul Saha. Yeah. So, I mean, an area that I didn't touch on, although I've sort of, um, you know, tangentially interested as well, is... Um, as you said, like somehow constraining machine learning with physical laws um, that was touched upon in the last talk and maybe some of the talks earlier in the week. Um, or <laughs> you guys could just label a bunch of data um, and that, that would also help as well. So taking domain knowledge from atmospheric mechanisms and physical laws to um, inform 
um, to have more informative data. And I think Kartik's also involved in a project to get together a lot of crowdsourced data. Um, is it possible to integrate the SAR interferometry techniques to the deep learning setting? Um, oh, you mean the way that the data is actually measured? Okay, that I don't know. I was treating SAR as input data. So unfortunately, I'm not the right person to ask that, but I think that is interesting. Um, if the data quality is low, then what will be good methods for the label noise issues? So somebody, I guess it was Mustafa today, mentioned how autoencoders are also used in this setting. Um, so there's a whole sequence of papers called like um, uh, noise to noise, noise to self, various um, autoencoder type techniques where you're actually trying to um, use an autoencoder or some unsupervised deep learning technique to help reduce the noise in your data. I think that might, uh, sorry, did I, did I interrupt? Did you have something? Oh no, to... I was just reading the other okay. question. Yeah, that might be a good place to stop. Uh, I'm sure there'll be more questions and uh, we can take some, some more questions of the panel discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Claire, for joining us today. That was a really exhilarating talk, and uh, we look forward to you at the panel discussion. Thanks. See you then.